Glad to see everybody in church this morning. Uh, this morning, we're going to continue our series, Jesus, the series. We are all the way up to season seven and episode two. I think we started this three or four years ago, and I love this, just being able to focus in, kind of camp out in the Gospels and look at the life and the ministry and the wonders and works of Jesus. So uh, I'm going to pray for us here in a minute, but I want to challenge you to kind of ask this question of yourself today. Are you ever guilty of losing sight of why we do what we do here on Sunday mornings? So in a minute, I'm going to pray, but I ask that you would pray with me that we would all together in this room really center our hearts on Jesus, that you would ask God to break you from any uh, mundane worship or routine as we approach Scripture today. Because this moment of worship, when we gather here today, this was never meant to be done begrudgingly or to be just part of a routine where we check something off a list. Don't let the routines and the repetition of church become a subtle path for you to become apathetic or forget the weight of what we're holding here in God's Word. So I'm going to go ahead and pray for us, and then we're going to pick up in the Gospel of Luke this morning. God, thank you so much for all the things that you've done. God, I thank you for this church community, this church family that you've given us that that we can lean on, that we can uh, share each other's burdens with. God, I pray that you would just break us from any mundane worship, any kind of uh, routine that's, that's kept us from fixing our eyes on you and your kingdom. God, help us to understand the weight of what we're reading today. God, move us with your word. Help us to fall more in love with your word and to understand the character of Jesus more through this message today. God, we love you so much. Amen. All right, so as I said before, we're going to pick up in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, if you want to turn that way with me, and we're going to be reading the first 10 verses in chapter 7. Now, to give you some context where we pick up in our story today, Jesus had just finished preaching the Sermon on the Mount. His public ministry was in full swing. He had already miraculously healed uh, several people. He was publicly preaching the kingdom of God, and things were starting to get shuffled up a little bit. And some people had some really bad opinions of Jesus, and some people weren't really sure who Jesus was. Some people were following Jesus and abandoning everything to follow him. But his public ministry was in full swing at this moment. And now Jesus was traveling through Capernaum, and when he was approached by a crowd of concerned Jews. Now, as we start reading, you're going to learn that the reason these Jews were concerned was a little bit surprising, because they were concerned about somebody who would have normally been regarded as a public enemy of the Jews. We're going to start reading in verse 1. It says, After he had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is the one who built us our synagogue. Let's pause for a second. Understand with me for just a minute how strange this situation would have been. See, because of the situation between the Jews and the Romans, the Romans were somewhat oppressing the Jews, right? And the Jews uh, historically did not like the Romans. Any form of Roman occupation among the Jewish people would have made them feel hatred and uh, made them despise the Roman people. Specifically, Roman soldiers like this man, and even more so the leaders of Roman armies, because Jews had been oppressed and they had been mistreated so frequently by the Roman authorities. So what we have here is a Roman centurion, right, who would have been a military leader of about a hundred Roman soldiers, but he is beloved by the Jewish people in Capernaum. For a Roman leader to even have been tolerated in this situation would have been strange, but this centurion had displayed an unusual character and a kindness and compassion toward the Jewish community. It says that he was a generous man to all people. It says he even had a a, a Jewish synagogue built 
for the Jewish people. I believe these details are included here because it's so noteworthy how a Roman man of authority and power would treat people who he could have controlled and manipulated with ease. See, the way that we treat people matters. He was kind when the norms said he should have been cruel. He had authority, but he was gracious to people who wouldn't have expected it from him. He showed kindness to the Jews, and now he sent this message from the Jews to Jesus because he's worried sick and heartbroken for this sick servant in his house, probably a house slave, a house servant, somebody at the bottom of the totem pole. And he's sending these Jews to Jesus and saying, I'm so worried, Jesus, can you do something? So these Jews were excited to help. Picking back up in verse 6, it says, And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to Jesus, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but say the word and let my servant be healed. Say the word and let my servant be healed. For I too am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another one, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. And turning to the crowd that followed him said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. What faith we see in this Roman centurion. See, the Jews who loved this man, they came urgently from the centurion to plea for Jesus to heal the centurion's sick servant. But then another group of friends was sent while Jesus was on the way to stop their entourage, Jesus and these people, in their tracks. I thought it was kind of funny when I was reading this, thinking about this guy sent like two groups to Jesus now. And hasn't talked to him yet. Now we know the reason is a little bit different, but it kind of reminded me of middle school when you have a crush on somebody. I, I saw this this week in after class. Okay, I'm standing there and I hear this girl talking to her other friend and she's like, man, you know what's hard? Asking out boys. <laughs> and so I'm like, you know, like doing my thing over here and I'm trying to listen in. And here's what I watched. She sent her friend to go to this other guy to say, hey, this girl over here really wants your number, but she's too afraid to talk to you. And then I saw them walk back over together to find something to write with while the other girl walked off. <laughs> so as I'm studying this week, I'm like, hey, I just saw this. Where we're sending other groups of people to do our bidding for us. But that's not what we see here. It's not that this guy was so shy or anything like this. This message came because he didn't feel worthy to even be in the presence of Jesus, right? This wasn't like, like oh, I'm, I'm afraid to talk to you because, you know, like, like these middle schoolers. This is, hey, there is such a gap between my holiness and your holiness, and I am not worthy for you to even come into my house. This is why he's sending these groups. He understands the authority and the power and the worthiness and the holiness of Jesus, he says, Jesus, I am not worthy of your presence in my home, but it doesn't matter if you are here in my presence or not. I believe that you are powerful and you are who they say that you are. I know that if you would just speak the word, that my servant's health would be restored. It is obvious that you have authority gifted to you by God and just a word from your mouth will suffice. That's all I need. And it says Jesus marveled at him. Jesus was amazed at his faith. He declared the centurion's faith to be greater than any he'd seen in Israel, uh, greater than any of the Jews, any of the religious leaders around. Greater than the faith of the Jews, greater than the faith of the Pharisees. This centurion had unwavering faith in who Jesus was and understood the authority that Jesus had over life and death. The Greek word here used that is uh, translated to marvel is this word thaumazo. 
Now, I'm always nervous bringing words that I just learned to the stage. Scott and Phil make fun of me all the time. I am notorious for pronouncing things wrong. But I think I've got this one right. Thaumazo is this word. This word was used all throughout the Gospels. Right? This, this word was used over 40 times, almost always to describe the disciples and the witnesses of the miracles of Jesus. So Jesus would act, and people were awestruck at, the, at his power. And so this word was used that they marveled at what Jesus had done. But only twice is this word used to describe Jesus being in awe of something else. Only twice in the Gospels. The first time was when Jesus preached in the synagogue of his hometown. And it says that Jesus marveled, he was awestruck at the unbelief of the Jewish people. He was preaching in the synagogue at his hometown in the resistance and the doubt that the Jewish people had drove him to being awestruck. And he marveled at how rigid and cold and unbelieving that these people were. A picture is being painted here that the Jews who long awaited the promised Messiah, they were blinded by their own arrogance while this Gentile Roman soldier acknowledged Jesus is the Son of God and he has power over all things. And Jesus rewarded this faith and he healed the servant without ever stepping foot in the centurion's house. And we learn so much from this miracle of Jesus and this story of this centurion. We're reminded that God holds supreme authority over all things. God holds supreme authority over all things. As this miracle took place and beforehand, all of the surrounding towns and cities were all buzzing. There was rumors flying around and stories and conversations about Jesus and who Jesus really is. Who is he? Could he actually be the son of God? And Pharisees would ask Jesus, who gave you the authority to say and do the things that you're doing? And people were asking questions, who does give Jesus authority? What authority does he have in this life or the next? But the centurion, a man under authority of Caesar, and a man who had authority himself over a hundred soldiers, knew that Jesus had ultimate authority given to him by God the Father over all things. Jesus had ultimate authority given to him over all things by God the Father. So with this centurion, we don't see an arrogant power struggle. right? That's what we probably could have expected. The centurion to uh, flex his muscles on Jesus. Look, Look at the position that I'm in. But there wasn't a bribe, there wasn't a threat, there wasn't a power struggle here. He knew that the greater authority than his own was found in this person of Jesus. And he could submit himself to that great authority with humility and faith. Yes, I am a person of authority, but Jesus, clearly you have the greatest authority of all. So I can come in humility, I can come in faith that you can do greater things Than I can do. See, there wasn't much the centurion could have done, but Jesus held authority over death and life. He held authority over sickness and health. Just with a word, Jesus could bring healing and comfort and energy to a man miles away because the centurion simply asked genuinely in faith for that thing to be done. I love the way the centurion says back in those verses. He says, I too have authority. And at my words, my servants and my soldiers move. They act at the command of my voice because I have been given authority as well. And Jesus, in the same way that my words have weight because of the authority given to me, your words are powerful because you have been given authority by God to do some bigger things and to speak with more authority than I ever could. And I believe if you just say the word, sickness will be gone from this servant that I love. The centurion has the authority in his words to command an army and to move soldiers strategically wherever he desired. But Jesus had authority in his words to cast out demons, to make blind people see, to make sickness leave 
a body. In the centurion, we see a man of power recognizing and bowing with his life to a greater power. Let this be a shot of wisdom to the leaders in the room. Those of you who have authority over other people. Remember, as great as you may be, there is one greater than you. And your knee will bow to him one day. Submit yourself to the supreme authority of Jesus. Lead well and love those that you've been entrusted with authority over. There's nothing worse than a leader who thinks he is the end all be all. I am at the top. There is one higher than you. Always remember that. We saw this in the centurion. He says, I am a man of authority, but Jesus, your authority is so much greater. You hold supreme authority over all things. There was an understanding, an acknowledgement that Jesus held authority unlike the authority of the centurion. Just a word from your mouth, Jesus, could move mountains. This leads us to another truth revealed in this story. That Jesus' power isn't based on close proximity. Jesus' power transcends time and space. It doesn't matter that Jesus wasn't in the room with this man. Jesus' power is so far beyond that. The soldier believed the rumors that the Messiah had come and that Jesus was, in fact, the Son of God. And further than that, he understood it didn't matter if Jesus is even in the room. I'm going to stop you in your tracks, Jesus, miles away. It doesn't matter if you're here or not. I know that you have power over this situation. Jesus had the authority to heal who he wanted, when he wanted. And the centurion said, Jesus, if you just say the word, that is enough. The same way in the beginning, God spoke the universe into existence out of nothing with just an imperative word, let these things be. He believed that there was power in the word of Jesus just the same. As I studied for this message, I was reminded that even Mary and Martha, who spent time with Jesus, they lacked faith at the death of their brother, Lazarus. They thought that Jesus needed to be present to keep Lazarus from dying. And when Jesus arrived days later, they said, Jesus, if only you had been here days ago, you could have kept Lazarus from death. But Jesus didn't need to be there to heal him. Jesus' power is not limited to close proximity, limited to our perspectives, limited by anything we think could hinder his power. Jesus is all-powerful can't be confined to the boxes that we try to place around him. I'm not sure if this centurion ever met Jesus in person. But Jesus' power wasn't contingent upon them meeting face to face or Jesus touching this sick servant in person. Jesus is all powerful. There is power in the very words of Jesus. And what God speaks will come to be. See, when he told Lazarus to rise with his words, death couldn't hold him. When he told this servant to heal, sickness had to leave. It doesn't matter that Jesus wasn't in the room because he is so much bigger and mightier than these limitations that we place on him. There is power in the very words of Jesus. Enough to breathe out planets and enough to heal a sick servant. So as we wrap things up today, looking at this story, I don't want us to miss a valuable lesson, something that we learned from this centurion as to how we approach Jesus. We should come to Jesus with humility and faith. Simple as that. We need to come to Jesus with humility and faith. I love the humility of this Roman soldier. First, he sends the Jewish leaders. Then he sends another group of friends to say, Stop, Jesus. I'm not worthy of your presence. I'm not worthy enough for you to enter my home and be in the same room as you. This is interesting because these other Jewish leaders came to Jesus and said, He's worthy. He's worthy of you to come and heal his servant. 
Look at all the good things he's done. He's worthy of this. But this servant or this soldier understood it's not about what I've done for my community. Jesus' holiness is so far beyond this. I'm going to come to him in humility and say, I am not worthy of your presence. I'm not worthy for you to come and visit me. I believe that this uh, gospel writer wants us to see this contrast between the humility and the faith of this Roman soldier and the humility and faith of the Jewish religious leaders. When the Pharisees came to Jesus, they questioned his worthiness to be in the presence of their inflated egos. What looked like holiness on their part on the outside, but within they were full of evil and hypocrisy and pride. But when Jesus stepped into their presence, they questioned why Jesus was worthy. Then we have the outsider, a Gentile Roman military leader sent for Jesus, declaring himself unworthy of a visit to his house, acknowledging I am a sinner and Jesus, you are the sinless son of God. How could I ever be worthy of your presence? See, this kind of humility is required of us to believe the gospel. It's required of us. We cannot believe the gospel while approaching it with pride. We cannot believe the gospel and profess profess Jesus to be Lord all while thinking, I have it all together. I deserve this kind of love. I've done something to earn God's love and acceptance. You are wrong. We cannot approach the gospel with that kind of pride you've never understood the gospel, please hear this. The gospel is that we are not worthy, that we are broken, that we are sinful. We have been separated from God, and it's through the work of Jesus alone that we can be bridged back to a relationship with God. It's never through our own works. It's never through our own worthiness. See, the centurion could have boasted, look, I've cared for the Jews. I've cared about my lowly servants. I built a synagogue for worshiping God. Look how much I've done. How many of us approach God the same way? Look at my good works. Look at the things that I've done to earn your love or your favor. That's not the gospel, and that's not what we see from this centurion. He could have boasted, but he doesn't come with any of that. Instead, I am nothing. Who am I that the Messiah would visit me, would have compassion for me, would love me, would include me? I'm not worthy to be in the presence of Jesus. Remember back to that other occasion where Jesus marveled in Scripture. It was at the unbelief of the seemingly religious Jews in their synagogue where Jesus taught in his hometown. Their ignorance, their rigidness and resistance to Jesus was so astonishing. Jesus marveled at their unbelief. Then it's the faith of a Gentile Roman centurion who understands I need to come to Jesus with humility, looking at his holiness versus my holiness. I am not worthy to be in his presence. That's the faith that amazed Jesus. In humility and in faith, he declared, Jesus, I am not worthy, but Jesus, you are infinitely and eternally worthy. This would have shocked every Jew, but uh, fit the kingdom agenda that Jesus was teaching, that even Gentiles would be welcomed into the family of God through Jesus. It doesn't matter how someone looks or where they're from, their nationality, their ethnicity. Remember all the way back in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel 16, 7. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. 
So no longer would it matter that you were Jew or Gentile, this race or that race, from this nation or that nation. All that would matter is that a heart would be fully given to Jesus, submitted in humility, saying, God, I need you to intervene. I cannot earn a relationship with you. It's only through Jesus. So I'm coming in humility saying, I know I can never be worthy, but Jesus was worthy. Jesus did it all for me. What if we came to Jesus with this kind of humility, submitting ourselves to the Savior, and we came to Jesus with faith that He is powerful, that He is able, and He is good, and He holds it all in His hands, and faith that Jesus did enough when He said it is finished on the cross, that that's all we needed to be brought back to God? What if we had the faith that at just his word, things can be brought back to life? Things can be reconciled in our lives and that God can mend broken things for his glory. Jesus has authority over all things. And his power is not limited to close proximity. And he is worthy of our humble approach and courageous faith. If you would bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. band's going to go ahead and make their way up. I want to ask you to ask these questions of yourself this morning. Have I ever humbly approached Jesus said, God, I am not worthy of your love. I'm not worthy of your inclusion. I'm not worthy of your acceptance. I'm not worthy of who you are and what you've done for me. Maybe you've never made a decision to follow Jesus. I want to give you that opportunity this morning. Maybe you've never said, Jesus, I I follow you with my life. You've never declared Jesus to be Lord of all things and to be Lord of your life. I want to challenge you to do that this morning. He is worthy of your devotion. He is worthy of the throne of your life. If you've never called out to Jesus... I want to encourage you, I want to challenge you to approach him in humility and faith this morning. You could pray something like this. God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that sin separates me from you. But I'm putting my faith in what Jesus did on the cross to redeem me. I'm turning from my sin and I'm turning to you. Jesus, you be the Lord of my life. If you made a decision like that to follow Jesus this morning, to put your faith and trust in him, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to stand up or raise a hand. But we would love to celebrate that with you. If you could... Just write on your connection card this morning, I chose Jesus. Or come flag down one of the pastors here. We would love to talk to you about that decision that you made. Could we just pray for a minute? Just in awe of Jesus' power and his authority over all things, over life and death, over sickness and health, over your life and that broken situation in your life. Jesus has authority over that as well. And even when he doesn't feel close, his power transcends all things, and he can move and work in your life today. 